it. So uh, we have to come up with something really interesting to get you away from them. Um, so this is, I guess, like a mini sonar, um, but this is pretty much the state of the nation with regards to investors. So a lot of people on the Momentum Wealth platform, you know, what have they done over the last year with their investments, with their savings? How have they engaged? You know, we can relate these kind of things to financial advisors as well. Um, how have people engaged with their financial advisors? What, are they, what kind of decisions are they making with their money? And that really is, I think, the big, the big part of what we're doing today. Overall, this is really all about, um, about South African financial decisions and how they engage with their portfolios. Um, my name is Paul. I look after behavioral finance for Momentum Investments. And you know, from a sort of burgeoning behavioral science capability, we're taking a lot more interest in what people are doing with their money. So that we can start looking at, at strategies like nudging, for example. So how do we, you know, there's a very popular buzzword in behavioral sciences, you know, which has been actually for the last 10 years or so. How do we get people to make better decisions with, with their money? Now, nudging is quite a spicy topic as well. So it's about sort of, you know, many, many people consider it manipulation. You know, so there's, there's a very strong ethical dimension behind nudging. You know, if you think these days of vaccines, you know, should we be nudging people to take vaccines? I mean, there's, there's quite a few spicy topics and discussions we can have around nudging. But in terms of financial decisions, I think it's all what we're going to show today, some of the evidence today, that definitely nudging strategies will definitely be helping people to act in their own best interests, because at the moment, they're definitely not doing that. Okay, so one of the first things we did at Momentum Investments was to look at this concept of a behavior tax. So, you know, were people, the decisions that people are taking with their money and their savings, especially regarding switch decisions, so that's changing the plan along the route to getting to an investment goal, are they adding value by those switch transactions or eroding value? That's really the first big question. So we've seen a lot of studies. There have been some stuff being, uh, that's released by Dolbar every year, the quantitative analysis of investor behavior. There's been some research released by Barclays. There's been a lot released by Morningstar with this concept of a behavior gap. So what we do is we just classify that as a behavior tax. So how do we calculate a behavior tax? We have a look at someone's investment portfolio. If they're holding fund A and fund B and they move from fund A to fund B, we continue to track fund A. And at the end of the year, we have, we have a look and see which performed better. So if fund B performed better, for example, that's a negative behavior tax. If fund B performed worse, it's a positive behavior tax. In other words, someone has eroded value. So the lines that you can see on your screen, or the, the red line that you can see on your screen here, um, pretty much is showing you that anything above that 0% mark, people are eroding value. Anything below that 0% mark, people are adding value by switching. And we're going to talk a, a lot about that mountain that's appeared from, from COVID-19 recently as well. You can see the timeline there. From August 2006 to February 2020, uh, sorry, to February 2022, actually, yeah. So um, there's a lot of data behind this analysis. So around about 35,000 investors, um, 100, over 130,000 switch transactions from Fe uh, August 2006 right up until February uh, 2022. So what you can see, there's, there's three big things that you can notice about the diagram. Number one is there's an asymmetry, right? So people are destroying more value than they are adding value. So you can see that the area of these little mountains here above the line is greater than the area below the line, basically. So overall, the question is people, if they're moving money around, are destroying value as opposed to adding value. The second big thing that you can realize, or you can quickly see here is that when people destroy value is generally speaking around market turmoil. So so when there's, when, during very, very volatile markets, when people are moving money around, they're destroying value. And on, in many cases, actually quite a bit. So if you look at lo the global financial crisis in 2008, that behavior tax was around about 4%. Um, if you look at the next volatile period, that's when the bull market ended from the financial crisis. You can see that from February 2014, you can see the behavior tax accelerates up and around 4% again. What you can see, interestingly, between those two rectangles, though, is during the bull market, the behavior tax is negative which kind of makes sense because if you're moving money around and asset prices are rising, it doesn't really matter what you're doing because you're pretty much adding value anyway because asset prices are rising. The last one you can see though, obviously, is the big mountain around COVID-19. COVID the big thing about this diagram here is that when markets turn is unpredictable. So that's the second important point, right? No one can predict when markets are going to turn. So if you're switching money around and the markets happen to turn, like they did just after the bull market, with 2014 markets became flat and fluctuating, people incur a strong behavior tax, rather that behavior tax accelerates quite quickly. Obviously, no one predicted COVID-19. COVID and you can see there again that the two largest behavior taxes that occurred in recent history actually were um, around about 6.5% in 2020. That's when COVID started. And then 3.5% 3 
um, for the 2021 period, which is where the which is the um, the duration of the SAFAR report. The SAFAR report is all about the 2021 period. All right. So very, very importantly, market volatility is going to cause large behavior taxes when we can't predict when markets are going to turn, which of course we can't, and people are switching money around, they incur a large behavior tax as well. Six and a half percent is the, uh, during COVID-19, that's six and a half percent of someone's portfolio value destroyed per switch that they make, right? So that's on average. Now remember as well, averages are hiding stuff. So I mean, there've been thousands of investors who've destroyed far more than that, and obviously thousands who've destroyed less. All right, so this is pretty much the problem. So when we look at, a, at building a behavioral science capability, this is one of the problems we're trying to solve. Right? We're trying to help people manage their behavior so that they make better financial decisions. What we can see out there globally as well, though, is a rather concerning trend. Right? So people, it seems, so there's two important things here. So number one, people are saving more. Right? So COVID-19 has, has helped people, many people, save a lot more. So S&P Global reported an additional $1.6 trillion in the U.S. economy from additional savings. Right? We're not going to Starbucks or Vida E on the wall, not anymore. Um, maybe you did today but not in general, we're not doing that anymore. Our cars are staying in our garage. You know, we're cooking more meals at home. We're having lunches and dinners at home, and that is resulting in more savings. So, so globally, that is the trend. Canada, 80% increase in savings to GDP. South Africa, lagging quite a bit, actually, from global, or behind global statistics, around about 20% increase in savings to GDP. Okay, so people have more money. But it seems to be that this kind of trend is shifting people away from financial advice. And that's, kind of, that's quite a concerning thing that we're seeing, we're seeing globally, and I'm going to sort of bring it a bit closer to South Africa um, shortly. So this was a survey done in Canada. One in 10 people basically in Canada are saying, I plan to ditch my financial advisor and go it, my, go it on my own for 2022. Okay, so why are they doing that? So these are some of the reasons that they've, they've cited. Okay? Number one is to have more control over my money. So think about what happens psychologically in a, in a global pandemic. Okay, there's a lot of uncertainty floating around. People have money now. Well, they have a little bit more money in general. So what, how do people sort of get rid of uncertainty? They, take, they try to take control over stuff, so they try and make their own decisions, right? So we move away from kind of looking to other people to help us, and we start taking decisions ourselves. You'll see at the bottom of the screen there, by the way, these numbers won't add to 100 because these people in the survey could have selected more than one option, basically. If you look at the bottom part of the screen there, the bottom right-hand part of the screen, 54% of people saying they want to save money on fees. Now, basically, if people tell you they want to save money on fees, it means that the perceived value of financial advice isn't great, right? Because, obviously, if you, if you get value from something, you're happy to pay a fee. Moving to the top of the screen, 25% um, people saying, I feel knowledgeable enough about my investments, right? That speaks a lot to one of the most prominent biases in behavioral finance, which is, which is overconfidence. So Daniel Kahneman, who's the Nobel Prize winner, father of behavioral economics, said that if you had, if you had a magic wand and could wish away one behavioral bias, it would be overconfidence. Okay? And if you think about how dangerous overconfidence can be, you just have to think about the Titanic. 25% of people saying they don't want to ask someone to make investment decisions or transactions. So people are seeing it as a mission, like why do I need to ask, if, if I want to move my money around, why do I need to ask a financial advisor to go and do the admin behind that? Why can't I just do it myself? And that's going to go strongly in line with the bottom left-hand 21% left -hand, uh, there, which is you know, convenience of new online or mobile investment services. So the financial services industry in general is also making it more easy to engage with your savings. They're making it easy to perform transactions as well. So there's a, there's a lower friction cost as we move to a more digital world. All right, so this is a relatively concerning trend. Um, of, um, and it, although one, one in 10 people in Canada... Interestingly as well, these people are younger. So it's the Gen Zs and the millennials over there that are most concerned about what's happening with their money. All right, so if we look at it as, an, as an industry in South Africa, we've got a little bit of a, a concern. And one of the biggest things is, so a, a place by the name of Russell Investments, there have been a number of these studies done as well, try to calculate the value of financial advice, right? Now, the one I'm going to focus on here is this amount of 2.02% from behavioral coaching, right? So what the study is basically saying is that if you have a financial advisor who is a good coach, or mentor, they can save you 2.02% per year. Okay? Now that kind of makes sense if you look at the behavior tax figures that we were seeing on the first slide, regularly, regularly over zero, a lot of the time sort of fluctuating around that 2% mark, you can see that that figure kind of makes sense. I think as an industry though, the big problem we have is we haven't told people about that. So you know, if you go and ask people out there, you know, kind of, is your financial advisor a behavioral coach? You know, how much value are they adding as a behavioral coach? I don't think many people would be able to answer that question. And the reason they can't answer that question is because we're not telling them how much fun, uh, value financial advisors are adding by being a behavioral coach. 
There was a very interesting study done by Morningstar, um, I think it was last year, it might have been 2019 or 20, 2020. They asked customers to rate the top 15 attributes that they wanted from their financial advisors. Now there were some very concerning things coming out of this as well. So number one, the top, top financial, or the top attribute they wanted from financial advisors helped me to get to my investment goals. Okay, that's a big tick, that's great, right? Because that's what financial advisors are supposed to do. There were two other attributes though, help me stay or keep in control of my emotions, okay, and act as my financial coach. Those came last and dead last, respectively, right? So people don't value behavioral coaching, at least not yet. Okay, and I think in many cases, people don't know what that is. And of course, when you ask someone, you know, I, I, would, <laughs> I would imagine males as well, are you in control of your emotions? <laughs> I'm not sure what kind of answer you would get if you asked a male that kind of question as well, right? So you can see the ABC, PT, those little blocks there. You, you can see everything, all the other blocks there are pretty much tightly clustered around the technical dimensions of financial planning. Getting me into the right product, um, making sure the product aligns my goals, rebalancing my portfolio, um, and product alignment as well. That's your tax planning. All right, so that, that comes up to about 4.83%. The most important part though is the behavioral coaching dimension is something that I don't believe has really been landed yet as a value proposition from advisors. Now, if we go back to the Morningstar study as well, number two on the list was that client said, I want someone who's gonna help me maximize investment returns. So what that's telling you is that there's a faulty belief system that believes that maximizing investment returns is going to get you to your financial goals. And that's not always the case. Because along the way, we end up destroying a lot of value in this behavior tax because of the actions that we take in our portfolios. All right, so if we get a little bit closer to South Africa, what happened in the 2021 period? This was a record year in terms of engagement of people between people and their portfolios, right? Record year, 27,994 switches. There was an 80% increase in the, in the number of active investors. When we say active investors, that's someone making at least one switch transaction, okay? 169,000 Rand was the average switch amount, and the overall behavior tax for 2021 period was 90 million Rand. That equates to the 3.5% that I, that I alluded to on the first slide as well. And there have been a 50% increase in the number of switches performed, right? So people are becoming, again, it's that trend from the previous slide I'm talking about as well, people are becoming more engaged with their, um, with their savings, they want you to take more control, and we don't know as yet, and that's something that we need to figure out as well, is the financial advisor's role in that. All right, so what we're gonna do now pretty much for the next couple of slides is just dig into this behavior tax a little bit more. Okay, so what you can see there on, your, on, the, on, the, uh, on the board is the savvy over that period, so September 2020 to October 2021, and the all share index as well. All right, so what are people doing or what have people done over this period? You can pretty much see that there's a very close alignment with the savvy. All right, so the South African Volatility Index, you can see spikes are pretty much correlate very, very tightly to risk off behavior. If you can see a negative number there, what we pretty much do here is we take the, uh, we align the asset allocation, the, uh, the average asset allocation of the switches to our flagship portfolio. So those are the CPI plus two, three, four, five, and six mandates. And then pretty much we have a look at where you, where you switched from and where you switched to. And if there's a negative number, it just means you're de-risking your portfolio. If there's a positive number, it means you're increasing risk in your portfolio. So we can see a trend here of risk off behavior from the first and second savvy spikes. Okay, you can see there's a lot of market vol volatility there. And then there's quite a big flight back to, um, as investment re returns come back into markets as well. Okay, and you can just match those up with the, ret with the returns on that side. But what you can see here, which is very interesting as well, that when people actually go back, if you look at that sort of block there or the risk on behavior, and you look at, glance on the right-hand side at that, that rectangle there, you can see that people are late to the party, right? So market returns have actually re back, and, but when people actually start moving money back to risky assets, the market's already recovered. Well, actually the returns are already back into the market. In the top there, you can pretty much just see that the average number of switches is, is very, very high around the period of market volatility, and then it tapers off from 6,500 to 1,500 switches. Because pretty much what you can see here again is, and this is the, the most important part of the slide as well, is that you can't tell me that people's goals are changing as well timed or as well in sync with market risk and returns, right? So there's still a very, very strong trend out there of people trying to avoid market turmoil and trying to take advantage of market returns, right? And switching money around accordingly to try and do that. Now, what you can see as well is it's some very, very good evidence of how this doesn't work. So first of all, we've got the behavior tax, right? The behavior tax tells us it doesn't work. If we want to look at a little bit more detail behind the funds involved though, we can have a look here. So here are four cases of where we have a look at once someone has made the switch, 
What was the performance that they, what was the performance of that fund, the 12 month past performance of that fund? And then we have a look at the performance that they got after the switch. And we basically answer the question here, are people rewarded for switching the money around? So the Coronation Global Emerging Markets, Markets Flexible Fund, the top four funds you'll see had net inflows. So the greens had net, were net inflows. The bottom three funds were net outflows. Okay, so the top four funds are people moving to that fund. Bottom three funds, people moving out of those funds, right? Top four funds, top fund on the list, Coronation Global Equity, uh, Global Emerging Markets Flexible Fund, 31 million rand net inflow. Previous performance, 27.73%, a likely explanation of the inflow. Then what happened in the next year? Minus 9.32%. Coronation, the, the trend continues. Coronation Optimum Growth Fund, 8.2 million rand inflow. 2020 return, 22.15%. 2021 return, minus 3.31%. Now, by the way, I'm not picking on funds here. Um, you know, asset managers, cycles up and down, that's fine, right? I mean, all funds are going to give positive and negative returns. The problem, though, is, is if you're going to make your investment decisions based on past performance, this is often what happens. Momentum International Income Fund, wonderful past performance, 8.85%. Momentum Flexible Income Fund of Funds, great past performance, 12.17%. 28 million rand inflows, 74 million rand inflows. What happened the next year? 0.21%. And still respectable performance of 6.45%, but 6% lower than the 2020 performance. I mean, if you go and look at property, that's a great, quite a sort of great case study. Property was absolutely smashed in 2020, right, for obvious reasons. So the Momentum Real Growth Property Fund, now we're talking about people leaving the funds or the outflows, minus 6.9%. Why? Previous, or the past performance had realized at that point was 34, minus 34.89%. Property got smashed in COVID. What happened the next year? Plus 36.95% performance, right? Now, of course, what happened with these investors, they were gone already. They'd gone to something else. So you can pretty much see here, when we look at the behavior tax, performance is something that you switched from, performance is something that you switched to. These cases here would really, really incur quite a strong behavior tax for obvious reasons. And if you look at the Momentum Focus 5 fund of funds, the Focus 5 and Focus 7 fund of funds, which is further up the risk spectrum, net outflows are 12 and 14 million rand. Why? Very, very almost flat, um, almost uh, zero performance at 0.8 and 0.83%. What happened the next year? Investors there missed out on 15.84%. They missed out on 18.36%. Right, so this just gives you some idea of kind of the roots of the behavior tax. You would see in the full report though, it's not all like this. I mean, I've obviously cherry picked um, my, the sort of these funds here to make a case. But generally, if, we, if you look at the high levels of behavior tax, this is certainly some of the roots of that, um, of that, um, of that behavior tax. All right, so as we get to the end of the presentation, you know, what are we doing with all this stuff? Um, that's the most important thing, right? So if we talked about, uh, right at the start of the presentation, I talked about this idea of hyper-personalized nudging, be able to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time. What are we doing at Momentum Investments to get us into a state where we can do that? And the first thing we've done is to conduct a machine learning exercise to basically take all this data that I told you about at the beginning, so that's basically 35,000 investors, 130,000 switch transactions, and to apply some machine learning alg algorithms to see if there were commonalities or any behavior patterns that were occurring in the background. Now, when we have a look at the 2021 period and we apply the same algorithm, we can see that there are indeed behavior patterns and that different people are destroying value at different times. So let me just quickly explain to you what these different behavior archetypes, or we call them archetypes, are. The first pattern we noticed was something called a market timer. Okay? So the market timer archetype are the people who switch a lot. They switch the most. What also happens is they're very reactive in up-risking and down-risking their portfolios. They were the only group of people who do both. Okay? So they obviously like doing what other people are doing, Let's put it, or following other people. Right? That's why they're called the market timers. The assertive investor loves the next big investment trend. They are very, very active in up-risking their portfolio and switching to things with really great past performance. Okay, so a very, very strong pattern of people just doing that behavior. The anxious investor is kind of the opposite people who panic when markets shock. The big thing about the anxious investor as well is that it takes a lot of confidence for them to get back into markets. So they always miss the recovery, and that's really where the big behavior tax come, comes from for the anxious investor. Okay, so the anxious investor predominantly de-risks their portfolio and moves to things with worse past performance. Okay. Why would you move to something with worse past performance? If you look at traditionally, right, equities are always going to, well, not always, but generally equities are going to outperform cash. So if you're moving from equities to cash, de-risking, it's going to look like you're switching to something historically with worse past performance. The avoider, 
get stuck in safe assets, right? So the avoider, the avoider invests the most conservatively and then kind of gets stuck there. Now, there's another behavior tax that avoiders pay that we haven't even measured yet, which is inflation, right? So if you're going to invest in safe assets over the long term, you're going to incur an inflation-related behavior tax simply because your money is not going to be growing in line with inflation, right? Because cash doesn't give a return that is in line with inflation. All right, so those are the four behavior patterns that we see over the whole trend. When we relate this behavior or these behavior patterns just to 2021, this is the picture that we can see. Now, if you look at the packs that you have, you can have a look at the actual um, the sort of uh, behavior patterns of these um, archetypes over time as well. I'm not going to spend or get into too much detail on that today. I'm just talking about, again, that, that 2021 period. This is what happened. The market timer switched on average 3.14 times. They destroyed just over 22 million rand in value, and they paid the largest behavior tax at 5%. The assertive investor, less, 1.37, destroyed the most value, 40 million rand, behavior tax of 4.09%. Anxious investor, 1.22 average number of switches, destroying just under 10 million rand, behavior tax of 3.02%. And finally, the avoider, uh, 1.21 switches. By the way, you'll see that avoider behavior consistent throughout the timeline. You know, it's, it's consistent low level of kind of switching. And they also destroy in general as well, the least amount of value. It's all because they're staying in safe assets, they're not moving money around as much at 1.11% behavior tax. Big lesson from the exercise that we've done, the anxious investors over time always destroy the most amount of value for the reason that I've told you. They always struggle to get back into markets. So when markets shock, they move into safe assets. What they do is they realize that loss. So I mean, we saw in March 2020, for example, all share index drops to what, 37,000 points very, very quickly. People scurry to get markets to say, uh, sorry, money to safety. But what happened there, and you, obviously you saw in that mountain as well, with this massive behavior tax was that markets recovered extremely quickly. Three months of markets were back. And what happened with these investors, they were sitting on the sidelines, and then they bought again at the top. So they sold at the bottom, bought at the top. So anxious investors over time always destroy the most amount of value. But when markets go up and down, the market timer starts, starts destroying more, uh, more value. So in that case, you're penalized for switching more often. Okay, so these are the high-level results of the, of the different archetypes of behavior. And I think I'd like to close off basically by saying that, look, if we, if we look to the future and we look at this concept of nudging or hyper-personalized nudging, there's two big things that we're going to be doing. Number one is starting to look at personality or psychometric traits of these people. Right, so can we figure out what's going on in between their ears when they do this stuff? Okay. Now, psychometrics have a great property as well because they give you a result that's stable. So if you do a psychometric assessment, you know, all those assessments that you do before you, take, before you, um, before you sort of take, change jobs, they give a very good indication, a stable indication of your behavior. That's the first thing we're going to do. The second thing that we're going to do is to, to, to look at these hyper-personalized nudging strategies. If we look at a few examples here, how do we get avoiders into markets? Okay, so can we take long-only portfolios or our flagship portfolios and combine them with structures? So can we protect the anxious investor in times of market turmoil with structures, using derivatives, using these other kinds of really, really cool things that would actually change the payoff profile to an asymmetric one? So that doesn't give them equal upside with downside like everyone else has. So how do we stop the anxious investor from, from panicking in markets? How do we get avoiders into markets? You know, can we give them capital protection with market upside? How do we give assertive investors responsible gearing in their portfolios. And there are groups of people who get a high expressive benefit from, I mean, when was the last time you were all at a bri? I mean, it doesn't take very, very long for someone to mention what, they did, what they've done in crypto, right? So people get a high expressive benefit from picking the right stuff because it says something about them, or at least they think it does, right? So if you pick winners, it means you are a winner. If you pick losers, it means you are a loser. So people like to have things that are winning in their portfolios. It doesn't pay off. But if that is the case, if people want things that win in their portfolio, how do, we actually, how do we actually create responsible gearing in someone's portfolio so that they have a well-diversified portfolio, but that they have these things that they can talk about with their friends about, about sort of making calls in their portfolio, if that makes sense. And then finally, of course, how do we get the market timer to just not switch as much? All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is, that is my story.